Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tricia Sanders, and it's my privilege to be a part of the ImmuCore team. I'll be your MC for today's webinar. You may have noticed that we're using an uncommon webinar platform. Let me give you a quick tour around the screen and tell you the features of this platform. The orange outline is currently around the PowerPoint presentation. This window can be made full screen by clicking the window icon here seen in blue. Underneath the presentation area is where you'll find the section to submit questions for our speaker. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's session. And if you're watching a replay or watching it on demand, you can still submit questions. Those questions are forwarded to the ImmuCore team and we'll forward them to Dr. Mangelo um, as soon as they are received to us. Then we'll follow up via email. The orange outline is now around the media player. This is where you'll see the speaker's video. You probably see us there right now. <laughs> if you would like to make this into full screen, not sure why, but you could uh, by clicking the window icon here in blue. Last but certainly not least is social sharing. Feel free to share this out to your social profiles so that your colleagues know that you are committed to continuing education. The best part of this new system is that when we're finished, you can receive your CE certificate immediately. It is required that you complete a survey first. To do this, simply click the survey icon highlighted here in orange and fill out the very few questions. Then after the survey is completed, you can click the graduation cap or mortarboard icon to request your certificate. It will be available via PDF for you to print or save. At any point during the presentation, if you need technical assistance, please click the help icon highlighted here in orange. We are excited at, to announce that for 2023, ImmuCore is launching a back to basics histocompatibility top to bottom webinar series. As you can see from the schedule on your screen, we will be covering virtually every topic in transplant medicine. You can register to attend these webinars at www.immucor.com slash events. ImmuCore's legal team would like me to remind you that this course content is for information and illustration purposes only. ImmuCore makes no representation or warranties about the accuracy or reliability of the information presented, and this information is not being used for clinical or maintenance evaluations. The opinions contained in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of ImmuCore. All right, uh, Massimo, why don't you go ahead and take control of the slides and I'll tell the folks who don't know you a little bit about you. Dr. Mangelo holds a PhD in clinical and experimental immunology from the University of uh, Genoa, Italy, and is an associate of the American College of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics. Dr. Mangela is has more than 15 years of experience in transplant immunology. In the United States, he has trained at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, and has directed or co-directed HLA laboratories in Boston, Providence, and Pittsburgh. Currently, Dr. Mangela is a clinical associate professor and the immunogenetics laboratory director at the Transplant Institute of the NYU Langone Health in New York City. Dr. Mangela has served in several committees and is the current scientific curator of the HLA Eplet Registry. He's active in research and has published in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Mangela is actively investigating the role of molecular HLA mismatch in organ transplantation and the immunological barriers to um, xenotransplantation. All right, Dr. Mangela, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Tricia. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, today we're going to talk about um, PRK, PIRSH, and, and the role of PIRSH in, in molecular compatibility. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll expand the, the entire um, uh, content in, in how we should probably use molecular compatibility and why we should use PIRSH in our regular B-cell epidemic compatibility. 
Um, we, um, as you know, the the um, post transplant, the most active, um, uh, you know, uh, presentation of antigen occurs through three different pathways. But the one that has the longest and and strongest duration is the indirect pathway of presentation. Under this pathway, we have, uh, as you know, the activation of CD4 T cells and B cell that will activate the cellular and, and humoral rejection. So the the uh, molecular mis the molecular compatibility and the theory behind molecular compatibility and why we want to do molecular compatibility is based on the fact that in the theory that if we can reduce the uh, or abrogate the activation of T, uh, CD4 and, and B cells, we could limit the activation of the uh, adaptive immune system or even actually abrogate the complete activation of T cells and, and, and B cells. So stop T cell rejection and formation of the novel DSAs. Uh, so the player in this pathway are, are uh, two uh, are the T CD4 T cells of the patient and the B cells of the patient. Those two uh, events uh, occurs independently in a way from one another at the beginning of the de novo sensitization, and uh, the the two activated cells will meet eventually in the germinal center to close the loop, and um, uh, and activate the B cells into uh, you know, long-lived plasma cells production of the novel uh, DSA. So let's look briefly through these two uh, the, these two mechanisms. So the T cell peptide mechanism that's where the um, the antigen presenting cells from the recipient are going to present a peptide that is derived from uh, no from mismatch donor uh, and HLA antigens, and these cells will be then activated. When this, uh, what happens to the, the activation of the T cells is a very important step in this process. So we have our T cell pool right here, and a um, uh, number of T cells will recognize a peptide presented by the antigen presenting cell. And then an important event will occur to these naive T cells, which is driven by the uh, expression of BLIMP1 or BCL6. If the naive T cells is pushed into um, upregulation of the blimp one, then the then the T cells is gonna uh, pro, is gonna um, you know the CD4 T cells is gonna move into TH1, TH2, 17 or Tregs. However, if the BL6 transcription is upregulated, then the then the naive T cells will transform into these very important cells, which is the follicular helper T cell. And this T cells is going to move in the, in the germinal center and, and stick at the BTB border, uh, waiting to connect with a cognate B cell. So the the fate of the and the fate of the B cells is sort of similar, a little bit more complex. Uh, the B cell can recognize known self um, epitopes um, through the BCR. And the BCR is just the immunoglobulin. So the immunoglobulin is specific for a certain epitope, applet, and it's gonna bind. So it's gonna bind to an epitope, um, mismatch epitope in the donor um, HLA. When that happens, the entire complex is internalized and the uh, HLA, uh, non-self HLA is gonna be processed and a peptide will be present in the MHC2 of the B cell. This is the selection one, step one for the B cell. The B cell grow, goes through four selection steps. The first one they have described is the, this one where the B cell sends uh, uh, an antigen, uh, directly from the uh, antigen presenting cells. Then the second step is activation of the B cells through an activated T cell. And then the B cell is gonna move in the germinal center where it's gonna go through selection number three, where um, the B cells will be exposed to antigens in by the follicular dendritic cells. And then finally, when this maturation occurs, the B cells is gonna move in the TB border 
what is going to meet the cognate T cell. And when that happens, and when the T cell is specific for the B cells, we'll see in a second, then the T cells, the B cells can be sent into full maturation where you have a long-lived memory plasma cells and long-lived memory B cells. So the full mechanism is, is very complex, right? And, and has two different branches, even though we always, when you look at the figure, we imagine the CD4 activating the, the B cells, but the B cells needs to be activated independently from that to begin with. So the rendezvous of these two cells happen in the germinal center uh, in the light zone. Uh, this is where the T follicular helper and the B cells that was activated can, can meet. And this, this meeting, this rendezvous is, uh, uh, is, is called, is under this, this theory of the linked recognition, which is the immune system fail safe mechanism is a mechanism that the immune system apparently has to prevent the generation of antibodies that are not specific for a target. And what this theory is, uh, is, is that this was discovered by, by Dr. Lanzavecchia many years ago. And uh, the theory uh, speaks about the fact that the T cells needs to recognize a peptide presented them by the MHC2 of the B cell. Uh, a peptide that is derived from the same molecule that activated the follicular helper T cells to begin with. And when that happens, we said the cells will go, the B cell will go into I stop switching, affinity maturation, and then long live memory and long live plasma cells. This is the, the, the end stage of the de novo um, activation of the immune system. Now, this theory is, uh, is what is also known as carrier effect or Hapten theory, and uh, this Hapten is is what links the T cell peptide to the B cell epitope. They are linked by the fact that there is a carrier protein that uh, from which the T cell sample and the MHC samples from. And this theory is uh, is actually in use every day in vaccine design. Um, many um, many common vaccine either for drugs like the methamphetamine. Um, or other other common vaccine that we use every day are based on hapten conjugate and what dr lanzavecchia was able to show is that uh, the tetanus toxin in t cells uh, will respond much quicker and a much lower concentration of antigen if they can they can meet the cognate t tetanus specific B cell cone, as you can see from this slide. So this is uh, so the recognition of, of 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 the same peptide is the link that causes the immune the B cells to react. So when we say in that in in, in the generation of immune response against a protein antigen, the B cells require the helper of the T cells. That is true because the there is two moments in the B cell activation where the T cell helper is important, but the, the the important fact is that the T cell dependent antibody response requires the activation of B cells from follicular helper T cells that respond to the same antigen. And so these already see that you can see that these already kind of links the two branches together to the same original uh, stimulation, right? And you see why this is important in a second. So Attempting to determine the risk of activation of the B cells and therefore the risk of the novel DSA by the lens of the B cell epitope is to me just half of the story. And uh, what we need is to remember that there is an important component to this mechanism that is MHC restriction and the presentation of non self peptide derived from uh, non mismatch HLA antigen uh, of the donor. And um, uh, not only because there's an important branch of the de novo activation, but also because, as shown by the Hapten and the uh, linked recognition theories, those are important to send the B cells into maturation. And luckily, we have a mechanism to study and quantify the amount of possible peptide presentation to the CD4 T cells and the MHC.
and that is the Pierce. So uh, we we know about Pierce is a, is a module is a is an algorithm that, that allow us to predict um, the indirect presentation post transplant. And what this algorithm for uh, does for solid organ is to the is, is is an estimation the number of the response of of uh, after transplant by kind of calculated the potential amount of peptide they are presented to the CD4, to the MHC2 of the antigen presenting cell. Briefly, the way it works is that you enter the HLA genotype of patient and donor at the allele level, although Pierce can calculate very um, accurately uh, the potential allele if you have low resolution. By my recommendation, of course, to use always high resolution genotyping. And what the algorithm does is to compare the two molecules and determine the uh, potential donor-derived peptides. Those are 15 MERS peptides. And this is just step number one. It's like, what are the peptides that are mismatched as compared to the HLA of the recipient? Now, the second Second very important step at this point is MHC restriction, because of course you can have from a molecule, you can have hundreds, thousands of peptides you can derive, but not all of them can be actually restricted in the HLA molecule. So what Pierce does is to compare, uh, to determine which MHC can actually be presented within the class two antigens of the um, recipient, and you can toggle within DR uh, spread, the R presentation of the research side where there is presentation from other class two antigens. And when you do that, the end um, uh, outcome of this uh, is the uh, presentation uh, to you through a very uh, easy to look heat map where you can see every single um, mismatch antigen at A, B, C, D, I, and D, Q and um, the presentation through the DR of self-DR. And, and, and for each of these mismatch, uh, Pierce is gonna identify a specific score and a total score. So you can look at the individual um, uh, contribution, say for example, from the DR or the DQ or the HLA or BOC or the total one. And, um, so what what is the the end point of this what do we do this for is that like in uh, um I, I given a number of potential Pierce is going to allow you to do is to uh, basically uh, characterize the donors by the risk of activating the CD4 pathway from the lowest risk donor to the highest risk donor. And um, uh, there is uh, an incredible amount of literature that you can find out there for Pierce and the correlation between Pierce and uh, the uh, rejection and the probability of developing rejection post-transplant. So I guess like, you know, for, for virtually every organ uh, all the way to stem cell transplantation, it's very clear that Pierce can give you a prediction of the risk of developing a rejection post-transplant. So, um, but you know the the MHC restriction is very important, and we cannot forget about the MHC restriction. And also the MHC restriction, you need to remember that is kind of disjointed from the B cell epitopes. So the capability of our B cells to recognize non self epitopes in the in the um, donor derived mismatch HLA antigens, and and the two phenomena are kind of uh, dissociated from one another and then linked together at the end of it. So uh, to, to make an easy example, I want to show you the uh, potential peptides derived from a DQ7 molecule that can be restricted by different DR antigens. And here I'm going to show you the DR1, DR15, 11, DR4, and DR17. And if I, if you look at uh, how many peptides derived from the DQ7 that can be loaded in this MHC class two, you see that the DR1 can spread, can present up to 31 peptides that are from DQ7. But look at the DR17, there is only nine peptides that the DR17 can present. 
so to to me this is a very important point and that is telling you that given the same patient and donor combination uh, you can have a differential expression of peptides derived from these donors and the question of course this begs the question is, is what is the end outcome of this right so you could uh, look at these two in a uh, two combination this recipient versus this donors dq7 and come up with a scenario of course where the as you can see the applet level mismatch above the rndq is very very similar right so these two donors are potentially identical from the aspect of the b cell epitope activation right but the, the dr the self dr are significantly presenting a different amount of peptides right so you need to imagine that there is no just one mhc in these antigen presenting cells there is a a, a load of, uh, of, of an MHC and uh, each and every one of them can present different peptides. So how is this affecting the outcome, which, which is, although the B cell epitope mismatch load is practically the same, the question is, is the T cell the same? And if the T cells is not the same, the activation of the T cell is not the same, what would the outcome be, right? So if the the clonal expansion derived from DR1 patients versus DR17 patients is different. How is this affecting the, the when the loop needs to be closed at the end in the germinal center, the production of the novel DSA and antibody rejection? Uh, in fact, as I was saying, these, these two mechanisms are kind of uh, working independently from one another for most of the of their activation. So the T cell clone is going to produce a T cell follicular helper. And then the B cell clone is going to produce some cells that have to go through a long phase of activation. And then these two cells will meet at that point right there when the match needs to happen, when the right cells needs to meet each other. And I'm wondering how that step is affected, uh, whether you have different expression of potential activation. And we know that if we take them individually, we know that a low peer score equal a lower probability of, of developing an injection, whereas a high peer score is a high probability. And you can make the same, um, the same uh, uh, content for the B cell activation, right? Whether you do it by Matchmaker or Emma or Snowflake, you will see that there's always the same correlation, high equal high risk, low equal low risk. But the question is like, what happens when things are slightly different between the two algorithms? So if we have a T cell clone and the T cell clone, uh, the T cell that is activated by the known self antigen is is, has a, a higher probability of being activated and there is a lot of peptides that are presented in different way to this and so there is a high Pierce score. Uh, you have a, the one thing that we don't know and we should investigate is what is the effect of a higher load of peptide presentation with the with the amplification, with the generation of a clone that is specific to those peptides derived from this molecule. And the same thing happens for the B cell clone, right? Uh, if you have multiple epitopes that are mismatched in the antigens, uh, does that correlate to, to a clone of B cell in the high epilem mismatch score uh, versus the low mismatch score. And what we know for sure is that like the, the two lows are, are, are good news and the high one are bad news, right? So high and high is bad news. But one thing that we don't know is like, what are the other combination? What is, what is high peers versus low B cell or low peers versus high B cell? And, um, you know, the, 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 this um, correlation between molecular compatibility and the outcome, so the rejection, is being studied through the lens of the B cell, uh, through Matchmaker, and I know uh, you have Snowflake uh, available. And for this B cell uh, epitope uh, algorithm, uh, we have found plenty of correlation. There is a, a 
huge amount of literature out there that shows how they uh, correlate with injection. Or we have used the T cell through Pierce. Uh, and also there, uh, there is a uh, tremendous amount of literature that you can find out there showing you the Pierce uh, co score correlates with injection. And for both of them, is is a simple mechanism. It's like high equal high risk, low equal low risk. And what we are trying to do now is to engineer transplants that are uh, directly aimed at having a low molecular mismatch, either uh, B-cell epitope and T-cell epitope. But the, because these two mechanisms are physically linked together, they need to be linked together for the link recognition uh, in the carrier uh, protein uh, theory, these two probably needs to use together. And when they are used together, probably going to have a better correlation. And there are several ways in which you can use this mechanism. Of course, the there is a higher, high, high probability that if your uh, patient and donor combination is, is low, very low epilim mismatch score, they also the peer score is going to be low. And that is related to the fact that there is a high level of a little match between the two ones. So you can assume that if you have uh, a little level mismatch, you're going to have very little potential for mismatch peptides between the two. But what happens when the two algorithms don't correlate to each other, and how this translates into uh, the uh, outcome and uh, how is the your prediction? And also, if you're, if you're, um, center is focused on engineering uh, a transplant based on the fact that a low molecular mismatch on the B cell side. Uh, what happens if you don't find those, right? What is your next move? How do you choose between the non low, which one is the lowest risk? And what I believe that the, the, the use of peers in this sense is going to help you figure out which one is the best donor and correlates much better with rejection. So to prove the uh, to try to prove, of course, that uh, using the uh, two molecular mismatch algorithm together improves the correlation with rejection. We did a study on uh, pediatric heart transplant supported by the C.C. Um, and the Enduring Hearts teams and, and the European team with Adrian Z with Dr. Michael Ellison. And um, when we look at our population, of course, uh, just like you would expect, uh, we were able to uh, find the low risk population. That's where uh, the Pierce score and the uh, B cell score, whether it was co whether it was uh, calculated with actually match maker Emma, were the same. Uh, everything was low. And then, of course, we had the high risk population where Pierce uh, was high and the B cell epitope was high. And then um, I'm going to just discuss the DSA side only. So the, the formation of the novel uh, donor species antibody. And, you know, when, when you try to correlate this with outcome, it's as expected, the low risk population was the one with the lowest risk of forming the novel DSA, whereas the high risk population it was the one with the highest probability of uh, generation of the novel DSA. And this is expected. There is uh, a tremendous amount of literature over there about this concept. I think we should just uh, make peace with it. This is a fact. Uh, outlier exists uh, every corner of science. Uh, but this is a pretty good science, and those molecular algorithms are very good prognostic um, tools to uh, estimate the probability of uh, generation of the novel DSA. But very interestingly, we found a third group. Um, this is the group where the two algorithms don't match to each other. What I mean is that there is a, there is a group of group of patient donor combos where the B cell molecular is low, but the T cell molecular mismatch is high, or the vice versa, the B cell molecular is high, but the T cell molecular mismatch is low, and that uh, actually happens with a certain 
proportion. And I will show you what is the proportion in, in a second. And so we need to think about the fact that there is this third group of uh, combinations, patient and donors, uh, and, and you know, you assume that it's binary, but it's actually not that binary, this situation. You will have uh, cases where the pH score is very really low, and, and, and it's not because there is any problem with the algorithm, but as I showed you before, the B cell, the, the MHC restriction is what can affect the amount of peptide presented and therefore the pH score. And, and so it's not necessarily uh, always the fact that if you have a high Apple mismatch score or Emma score, you will have always a high uh, pH score. Um, so we wanted to know what happens to this case, like what was the, the DSA generation for this case. And then when we went to look into, uh, actually, uh, this, this third lower risk group uh, was more similar to the low risk than the high risk. There was a lower proportion uh, of cases uh, forming the novel DSA. So this is clearly indicating that the, the two algorithms are, are, are telling you about two different pathways of the immune system and the response to de novo uh, antigens. And, and that they, 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 they are linked to each other. And if they are not in correlation with each other in terms of probability of activation, that the outcome is clearly different. So we need to look at this population has like an intermediate uh, between the low risk and the high risk. However, the way we are using it right now, because we are splitting the two events, of course, there will be a proportion of this population that we are defining as high risk, but because the other algorithm is low, there are actually no high risk. And this creates the opportunity for a second possible choice when you don't have the best choice by either of the methods. So, so again, if your center is uh, is working on lowering the molecular mismatch between patient and donor and using either the B cell or the T cell epitope, you might uh, you might uh, stratify the risk slightly incorrectly for this population. In fact, when we went to look at number. And, and we we invest we we question what was the number of cases that could have been reclassified. The first column right on the left hand side is the number of cases that can be reclassified as lower risk by the combined um, uh, pH or B cell. And and the two columns on the left is the individual number if you do the uh, B cell molecular mismatch through Hema or matchmaker. But as you can see, there is any proportion between five to 21% of cases. They actually uh, have a lower risk of developing DSA, but we are classifying them as high risk. So if I don't have the perfect case, of course, the perfect is zero, but the second best choice is a low molecular mismatch at the RNDQ. And the third best choice is what? Uh, if I look at it through the pH of the B cells, I don't have any other scientific way to see which one is the third choice if we don't have anything better. And, you know, the combination of the two, the two algorithms allows me to uh, identify the third population, the third case, which is the lowest risk of all the non-low uh, cases. And of course, because, you, you know, the molecular compatibility at B cell level is always being done by the RNDQ high molecular mismatch. I know that you will be wonder uh, well, what happens to the cases that are both the RNDQ molecular mismatch by either matchmaker or HEMA. And so we look at that as well to try to figure out is, uh, is, is there always the case that if your donor is high the RNDQ, there are also high peers at the RNDQ. And um, for, for uh, in our 100 cases, 40 cases were actually the RNDQ high by both type of algorithms, either B cell algorithms or T cell algorithms. And, 
uh, there were only a few cases, uh, six for uh, Matchmaker and three for Emma, where the B cell epitope is telling you that this is at the high risk, the RDQ case, but the Pirsch is telling you that there is a low score. And uh, if you look at, well, what happens on these cases, which one of these cases actually created antibody, you see that the vast majority of cases, although this is a very small population, but the indication here seems to be that it's only when everything is high, there is a higher probability of forming antibody. Whereas when Pirsch was low, although the B cell molecular mismatch was screaming danger, the, the uh, amount of cases that form antibody was very, very small. So it, it is uh, to us, at least to me, at least obvious that when we look at the molecular mismatch, uh, we need to combine the T cell epitope and the B cell epitope and the T cell peptides together. And the idea is perhaps that in the future we need to come up with a score, a total score, a total risk score that, that takes into consideration both branches of the de novo activation of the immune system. And the data that we have on hand in the pediatric court seems to in fact indicates that when you use the two algorithms together, you actually achieve a better correlation with rejection. And perhaps here the goal is not necessarily to define exactly what is the rejection probability that this patient have, but it's more the, uh, the fact that either in living donation, you can select the, the best option if you don't have a low mismatch on either side of the, of the branches, uh, but also this could result in the future, of course, as you can imagine, to a, to a personalized medicine type of approach where uh, immune suppression is tailored around the uh, probability of one's immune system to be activated by the mismatch presented, not only to the B cells, not only to the T cells, but to both of them because both the loop needs to be closed by both of them, not just one of them. So um, Mitch uh, Ellison, Mitch Dr. Dr. Ellison, uh, UPNC has been working on this uh, and uh, for uh, DR and DQ is, uh, we've been assigning low intermediate score. And so scoring the, B, the DR, scoring the DQ, scoring the combined, and he's been working on, of course, doing the the this the same uh, um, you know thinking with all the molecular mismatch and then combining them either with match make a pH M a pH so actually all of them together uh, and he's going to talk about this so I'm going to be very briefly please if you are at the ATC 2023 don't miss this uh, histone compatibility immune genetic session on Saturday uh, Dr. Ellison is going to present this data in, in a much more extensive way but there is also a lot of other very interesting topic that we've been working on at NYU with uh, Dr. Sommer and um, on, on the relevance of airplets and, and free of the airplets in the population, but also like equity of molecular mismatch at the B cell level. But uh, to return to this, you can see that this group right here in this Cox regression model is the lowest score. So this is lower by any means. Then there is everything in between the intermediate score and then there is the high score. And uh, Dr. Ellison is going to show you at uh, ATC how this correlates no matter how you look at it. But the bottom line here is that this really proves that there is a lot much more nuances there in this compatibility situation between TMB. And we should not just look at one over another, but look at the both of them. Again, the goal here is not only find the best donor for a living patient if this is what your center is willing to do but this is through the lens of what we need to do in the future which is lowering immune suppression and uh you know really improving the quality of life of patients i remember dr montgomery in one presentation was speaking about the fact that about 
uh, only 25% of patients post-transplant return to their uh, normal life, and that's a very, very low uh, percent. So the, the question is here, are we really improving the quality of life post-transplant of our patient or not? And it seems to be that the case where using this molecular mismatch tool and incorporating the PIRSH to your um, beloved B cell molecular mismatch is what is going to help us really risk stratify each and every one of the different patient and donor combination. And the end results of this in the future could be that our clinician will be able to uh, adjust immune suppression and lower the immune suppression in a much more meaningful way. Um, and all right, it, you know, to summarize, there is a lot of, uh, you know, um, obvious statements in my summary. Uh, molecular compatibility is definitely a better way to assess the immunological risk of a patient and a donor. And uh, yes, there is a lot of things that we need to learn. There is a lot of things that we don't know. Um, but uh, all the data that we have generated so far and they're available in the literature clearly indicates that when we need to assess patient and donor risk, ABDR antigen mismatch is absolutely not meeting the, uh, the um, you know, uh, this spot and it's, it's not giving us sufficient information. So we need to move HLA compatibility assessment from the antigen level to the molecular level. And you can use any of these tools. I uh, frequently, the most common question that I got uh, after presentation of molecular mismatches, which one of those are the is the most accurate? And uh, all of them are okay and all of them are um, imperfect in a way, but I guess if you are okay with the small imperfection, the single antigen beads by Lumix, I think you can live with the uh, small, uh, um, you know, little things here and there that this molecular mismatch algorithm has. But they they clearly show, and it's been proven virtually in every organ, uh, with small population and large population that the molecular compatibility is a great prognostic biomarker. The the and, and and it can be used and is used in living donation to engineer transplant that are lower risk. The question is, um, should we continue to determine the risk of a patient and donor post-transplant simply by looking at the two branches individually? And I believe that I have shown you sufficient data that uh, to indicate you actually need to combine these two tools together because this is what is going to give you the best uh, definition of the immunological risk for this particular pair. And so improve your risk stratification, which uh, will eventually lead an improved uh, immune suppression regimen and, and precise uh, patient-specific medicine. And uh, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take any uh, of your questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for your presentation. We have some questions coming in already. So let's go ahead and get started. What do you do if high resolution typing is not available? And then part two to that is, would a combination of Perch and Matchmaker be more informative? Um, so the, there are several ways in which you can, um, estimate the allele level from, from low resolution <coughs> antigen typing genotype. And, um, the, it's been shown by several papers, some papers anyways, that the, um, the risk of getting the wrong, uh, allele is is lower, but also if you do <clears throat> the amount of apple mismatch, it doesn't really swing left and right so deeply that a donor would all of a sudden became high risk when it was low risk. So we're talking about just few swings here and there. 
it's not precise and of course the way we should work is precision we, we um i remember sam hall one time says what well, we keep trying to what well, we keep saying we strive for perfection we need to do perfection striving allows us to not be perfect but we need to work with what we have uh you can do that it's been shown that the difference is not highly significant um but um the the second part is that in any case whether you have a low or you have a high my recommendation is to use both algorithms okay thank you another question does a high perch dr score in the context of a low b cell epitope score translate into a low risk for dndsa uh, but a higher risk for T cell mediated rejection? Wonderful, very, very good question. Thank you. Um, uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are working on it. I mean, yeah, ev everything is always being linked to T cell, the, to the generation of the novel DSA, every paper, mostly because some, the, the, the basics, uh, I mean, where this is coming from is non compliance, right? Uh, it, it, that's that's the way you can see, uh, but everything was always being focused on T on the generation of the novel DSA, and nobody has ever looked into the the T cell uh, effect. And yes, I do believe that the like high DR score and low B cell score for for DR or any any combo anyway when when the DRDQ are high by pH and low by by B cell is is that the perhaps the generation of the novel DSA is lower risk but the activation of the T cell has occurred and that can have an effect I'm wondering whether those are the cases and that's what everybody should focus at this point I think we can settle on the fact that high risk equal high probability of forming the novel DSA. But let's look at all those cases with early T cell rejection. Are they correlated with what is being asked in this question? I believe it is. I don't have the proof. I think we should work on that. I think it's very important because, for example, that could be the decision of um, full-time induction or different type of induction based on that. I absolutely agree. Yeah, you know, um, I'm wondering what you, what your, what is your view on the perch cutoffs uh, for publications versus establishing your own cutoffs? Um, I, yeah, it's, I, I have a much more radical way, which is a cutoff doesn't exist. I think the system is more dynamic. I don't believe in the situation where. Uh, six is no risk and seven is risk or 11 is good but 12 is trouble uh, i think is the system is much more dynamic uh we we should have of course some ranges in mind but i think it's more under these aspects it's more like uh differences in, in the range whether uh pierce is telling you the score is 100 and b cell is telling you the score is 50 or uh, 10 and 10 uh, versus 10 and 200, right? So it is the difference is, is more like when we are looking at antibody and we are trying to define the rather than really quantifying that it went from 3,000 MFI to 7,000 MFI, but rather describing the, the change, the difference between before and after. I think this is how they should be looked. Of course, when we do publication, we always need to show some sort of correlation and find the beautiful P. And that, of course, correlates with the fact that I need to say that above these numbers where I found a higher probability of finding antibody. But we know that, right? That's already been established. I don't think anybody should show another paper that shows like, hey, if you go above this score, there is antibody. I think now the point is working on the T cell side and the generation of T cell response, uh, so cellular rejection, and also the combination of the two in terms of like what happens when there are these wings in, in the two arms. It's much okay. more dynamic, I think. 
sure. So based on that, I guess I have a question then. Where else are there gaps in the knowledge and there's then a need for more studies and publications? Yeah, I think I think one of the gaps is the T-cell side, right? We don't know what's the real correlation between these molecular mismatches and the probability of activating T cell rejection. There is some that is brought up by um, the Nickerson group, right, in the in the single molecule uh, paper where they show that there is a correlation with um, BAMF1 rejection, uh, T cell rejection. Uh, but we need to do more extensive study on that. But also another thing is like uh, that I, I, I believe we should study a little bit better with some mechanistic investigation is what is the consequence of low mismatch, either at the T-cell peptide or the B-cell epitope? So uh, that thing that I was showing you where the DR1 presents 31 potential peptide, but DR17 only nine, with the clone generation. I mean, is, the, is, is this is this phenomenon stochastic or probabilistic? So is the presentation of more anti-peptides or the presence of more mismatch epitopes causing the clone to be larger or is not? That's another uh, point that I think is a blind spot for us because these two branches needs to meet in Germany center. Is that also stochastic or probabilistic? I mean, if the link recognition theory is in fact true, um, the T cells needs to meet the cognate B cells and vice versa. Is the clone size important? Interesting. Okay. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit um, to ask mm -hmm. this next question. Is there a role for PERCH score in DP antigens? Uh, possibly, possibly not. And I think, I don't think it's, it's like, uh, um, you know, a blind spot at the fact or whatever you want to call it, like, oh my God, it doesn't work. It's the nature of the molecular mismatch in the DP antigens that is much lower as compared to the RNDQ. So the polymorphism at that level is lower. So you have less steam that is coming from DP. But I'm not saying that it's not important. Uh, you know, the immune system, and I think like uh, even the experiment that Lanza Vecchia was showing, where I was showing you the T cell and B cell telon specific clones, the telon specific non B cell clone still were able to activate the telon specific T cells. They just needed more fuel, more antigen to reach the level, right? So is the DP adding fuel? I don't know. Probably, I would say, yeah. I mean, any any mismatch is seen by my immune system as non-self. I don't think it's going to say, well, I don't care because it's coming from DP. Is that if you look at just the, the DP side, I think your load on mismatch is too low for being like, oops, this is going to cause rejection. Yeah. Okay. Let's go this route. <clears throat> Pardon me. For heart, lung, and liver transplantation, there often isn't time to select the best donor. Has anybody used these programs for adjusting the induction or post-transplant immunosuppression? I can speak for, for me and for my center. Um, I think we should do both. Totally agree. That was the, the, the question up ahead from Dr. Hidalgo. Uh, which is like, what's the what's what's the impact on on T cell activation, and should we do more induction? Um, no, of course the molecular compatibility theory and and designing transplant to be low molecular mismatch is something uh, is going to naturally be um, for the for a long time at least uh, only related to living donation, right? You could do that with living liver, but to be honest, most of the time you receive this foaming and liver patients, you don't have time to be all fancy. Uh, so yes, the, I think right now the way you would use that in kind of a donation is either for, um, you know, deciding how much risk you have there for activation of the T cell side, um, because that is going to come first before even the B cell side. And you can impact 
the B cell side by impacting the T cell activation, of course. Uh, or like he, like he suggested, which I, we have used at NYU, uh, which, is, which is like if you need to, to, the, to lower immune suppression because of infection tolerance or whatever you want, you could decide how low do you go based on the molecular mismatch at the B cell level. Okay. Um, how about this one? Can these programs explain why a lot of DSAs are due to DQ antibodies? Um, no, sure. They're a little bit more an agnostic, these, these tools. They're just looking at um, polymorphic evidence and give you a probability. Uh, I think this is a larger, larger uh, question, which is why why do we form for the most the rndq antibody uh on the other on the other hand i want to i want to give you like another uh side of the coin which is why do pediatric form class one antibody but adult to do not right uh, you know uh, we chose the um, pediatric heart courts because we wanted to see the correlation with uh class one molecular mismatch and generation then of the SM class one and I don't have it in my adult kidney population, for example, they, I can blindfold it and get back, uh, you know, take one case is gonna develop the RNDQ. I think the these tools will not tell you why, because they're just a nasty, they are looking at difference and give you a projection, but we should study why. And I think that is more related to antigen loads, antigen presentation. I remember reading this paper they were showing um, uh, the uh, presentation of self-antigen. So they, they were looking at how self-antigen are processed in a cell and presented in the MHC. And the others were really, really able, without any doubt to me, uh, able to show that the, um, the, the, the preferential route for presentation was through of DQ antigen. Uh, so, Perhaps the Q, the Q peptides and the Q mismatch is uh, more immunogenic. I don't know if immunogenic is the right term, but um, it, it was obvious that the majority of the antigen, self-antigen presented by us derive from the Q molecules. So, and, and that, that might be one. Yep. Uh, how would clinicians interpret PERCH score on a typical report if those cutoffs are dynamic? Um, yeah, very, very good question. Thank, thanks for that. It's like, a, um, how do they interpret in your center uh, antibody? Uh, I guess, I guess y you are making an interpretation of it, right? Um, rather, rather than that, I think. I don't know if I would be comfortable with telling my clinician this number equal trouble all the time, this number equal no trouble all the time because we don't know that yet, right? So the best approach is zero and zero, right? That you know is uh, fully matched. The second approach is low, right? But don't forget that there's always the word risk after low. There is always risk, whether it's one mismatch or 10 mismatch, there is still risk. Right, so I think it's more minimization, right? It's not, uh, you know, you can cite any paper that says above 130 equal higher probability of correlation with. Um, so if you, in, in my opinion, if you do a one-to-one -one where you have like a cadaveric donor case and your peer score is, is um, 200, your uh, B-cell score is, um, 35, uh, it's it's high risk. Like, you know, if his uh, lower number is a low risk, but more than that, I mean, I don't think we need to, um, I think we should try to look at this without making this another creatinine and another MFI and be a little bit more strategic in terms of minimization of the mismatch level as opposed to an exact number where nothing is going to happen, everything is going to happen, because we all have cases in which we have mismatched a 1DQ antigen, and Dr. Tambor has a 
is a, a sea of cases that can show you that even one single mismatch can be a cause of rejection. So the, the point is that like, how much molecular mismatch loads do you have there? I have a lot, I have a little, I have none. At this point in time, I don't think we'll, we are able to say a number and, and I would stay away from trying to create another MFI and creating a situation here. Yeah. I think this last question is, is a great one for us to end on. Um, and that is our lab has created an account on the Perch website. We're familiar how to use it, but we're struggling to integrate to our algorithm. What do you suggest are the best cases to get started with? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. I, I you should do them all. I mean, I, I I don't know which which cases you should be using for. It changes time to time. Perhaps stick with start with the one that where, where you see like uh, a little level mismatch or like where the art is matched but the DQ is not vice versa. There will be three, four, and five. They are the one from the B cell standpoint they add the most molecular mismatch. A uh, single DRB3 mismatch is like 12 or 14 mismatch applets. So that already is intermediate risk. So maybe try to start with the one where uh, the DR and DQ, that is like, they are very similar, but not exactly similar. DQ6, a little level differences are very sweet to work on um, because you can see the the difference also in the peer side um almost like ocd at dr on the patient side uh side is very uh important because there is only one mhc and, and, and so the restriction for the mhc can cause peer score to swing a lot versus if you have two different dr they can uh, imagine DR1, DR17, or DR1, almost ago, DR17, right? So um, I will start with those cases before you take on perhaps on the fully mismatch. But I think now there are tools out there, and I mean, Imocor has, has the tool to allow you to do this on a regular basis, and that's what I'm working on on my end at NYU to create the system that allows me to do molecular compatibility from every living donor and every cadaver donor. I think we need to develop quantity and numbers so that we can answer some of the questions that we can't right now, like immunogenicity or frequency of a certain mismatch in the population. All right, thank you. At this time, I want to remind all of our attendees of the instructions to receive continuing education credits. So please remember that you should fill out this the survey on the left-hand side of your screen. And once you have done the survey, you can then click the graduation cap or mortarboard icon to access uh, that PDF and print or save for your records. <laughs> All right. So I also want to be sure that before we disconnect, um, everyone knows that Immucor created mascots to represent the ABO, HLA, and non-HLA. Uh, these mascots are represented on lapel pins. Great for your lab coat or decorating your badge. If you want to win one of these, be sure to follow Immucor on our social media channels. We do Trivia Tuesday every week. So if you go out there right now, you can uh, enter to win. Thank you, uh, Massimo, for your presentation today. And thank you to all of our attendees. We look forward to seeing you at a future ImmuCore Education event.